In this video, I'm going to give you the lowdown on Paxil. Paxil was the third SSRI that was developed, and it stands apart from the other SSRIs in that it is the most potent in vitro. In vivo, I do think that that translates into better efficacy. So when I have somebody who has severe panic disorder, who has uh, intractable obsessive compulsive disorder, I think of Paxil. I don't use it very much. I hardly prescribe it anymore, as a matter of fact. And the reason is it also has the worst side effects. For one thing, weight gain is a, a real possibility. It's quite common, and I think it's worse than what you might see with some of the others, like Lexapro or even Zoloft. And the sexual dysfunction is also worse. And I think that's also tied to the fact that it is the most potent blocker of serotonin reuptake in vitro, in the test tube. And so I think that that just correlates with worse side effects that are dependent on having too much serotonin around. And sexual dysfunction is one, and in particular, anorgasmia tends to be the worst of all the SSRIs. As a matter of fact, a very low dose of paroxetine, 10 milligrams, is an excellent, very effective and safe treatment for premature ejaculation. So you know, delayed orgasm is not always a bad thing, and if men are having trouble with that, then a little Paxil can really help, uh, really any SSRI, and also you get improved mood as a bonus. The other thing about Paxil is it is the only SSRI that is significantly anticholinergic meaning it blocks muscarinic acetylcholine receptors throughout the body. And so you get a host of side effects that are all nuisance side effects, everything from dry mouth to blurred vision to constipation to short-term memory problems that, that can be very subtle, but depending on your age and other things that you might have going on, might be actually noticeable because you're blocking acetylcholine where you want acetylcholine. Paxil also has significant withdrawal. It's not habit-forming in the way that cocaine or alcohol is, is habit-forming. And But there is a, a withdrawal that's better called a discontinuation syndrome, a physical discontinuation syndrome. That's better terminology because it doesn't suggest that that you can get addicted to it because it feels good to take it and that you need to take more and more of it to get the same effect and then you get withdrawal from it, physical withdrawal from it because you have dependence. All of those things that go along with substances of abuse don't really apply in here. However, your body does get used to it and for some people, I would say most people, in a dose-dependent fashion, so the more you take, the worse it is, if you abruptly stop taking it, not only are you risking rebound irritability and rebound dysphoria, bad mood, a low mood, anxiety, worsened obsessive compulsive symptoms, just depending on whatever it is you're taking it for, not only do you risk that, but you also risk feeling this physical syndrome that's characterized by lightheadedness and dizziness and and um, it's, it's hard to describe, but even these paresthesias that are described as electrical zaps, you feel like, like your brain is having these brain zaps. Very uncomfortable, very unsettling, and if you don't know that they're harmless, they can be pretty scary, but they're not harmful. The physical withdrawal is not dangerous. It doesn't harm you in any permanent way. It tends to be worse when if you turn your head real fast and again it's very common with Paxil. Paxil is not the only SSRI that does that. Lexapro does it, Zoloft and Luvox do it. Prozac is the only one that really you're guaranteed not to have it because the active metabolite has a half-life of a week with fluoxetine and norfluoxetine. And then the other thing that makes Paxil stand out that it is a pregnancy category D meaning it should not be taken during pregnancy because it is a known teratogen. It causes birth defects. Uh, the name Paxil means peace, and it is the SSRI that I think about, even if I don't always reach for it, when I see a very severe case of panic disorder. 
for example, or social anxiety disorder, where I really, we need the big guns, we need something that's going to be very potent, we could achieve the same level of serotonin reuptake blocking by giving a higher dose of, a, of another SSRI, but milligram for milligram, Paxil is more potent in vitro than the others. There are also some drug-drug interactions, so you have to kind of watch the enzymes that metabolize Paxil that also metabolize other medications. There are numerous drug-drug interactions where you have to be careful about the dosing of the other drug because taking it with Paxil changes its metabolism. So Paxil is uh, what we call a dirty medication. It hits a lot of receptors. It's not very very selective. It's the it's the most potent selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but it's not the most selective selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That would be escitalopram or uh, Lexapro. So paroxetine, it works, uh, but I almost never prescribe it for that reason. And, and the patient that comes to mind is the patient that has panic disorder that's so severe and that's so intractable, it's poorly responsive to standard medications like Prozac and Zoloft, that I have to be giving three times a day clonopin or Valium to calm this patient down. And, and in those cases, cases with agoraphobia and just all kinds of complications that I, I know we're going to need an SSRI plus, I know from the outset that they're, because of their history and how they're responding and the severity of their symptoms, that we're going to need more than SSRI monotherapy. We're going to need an SSRI plus other medications, possibly plural. And in those cases, I might reach for Paxil first because since I already know we're going to need a high dose of an SSRI plus other medicines, I might as well get the SSRI that's going to be at least in the test tube the most effective at blocking the reuptake of serotonin. At the end of the day, it's serotonin that's coming to the rescue. That's what we also have to keep in mind. That's what all the SSRIs have in common. What they really, the way they really differ are in terms of side effect profile and other effects that they may have that they don't share. But it's serotonin and the increased serotonin at the, at the synapse where Neurons can have more serotonin to, to use to communicate with one another. That signaling is what calms down anxiety, improves negative thoughts and mood, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the more serotonin, the better. When we start to combine Paxil with other medications like clonopin and Valium, then we're now we're also uh, recruiting other neurotransmitters. GABA, GABA amino butyric acid, and, and other things to calm people down. But that's beyond the scope of this. Already too long 